So glad that you are here at Mountain View today. Uh, as summertime is wrapping up and we're getting into this uh, new fall rhythm, I'm so glad that you're with us today. For about 30 years, around 587 BC, the people of God were absolutely obliterated. They were conquered beyond measure to the point of sheer catastrophe for the people of God. They suffered starvation. Family and friends were slaughtered right before their eyes. Foreign nations had burned down the very place of God. And they carried thousands of people off into exile. They stripped the nation of God from the place that God had promised them. And the people of God were plagued by a government that contradicted every core conviction that they held dear. And so the question arose in that moment, a question that often comes up in our own cultural moment today, what does the community of faith do when they're persecuted and powerless? I'll tell you what the community of faith did then back in 587 BC. There were several different groups, several different communities that formed, factions that came together as a response to the persecution is a response in the moment when they felt powerless. And one of those groups was the revolutionary combative group. This was the group that collectively decided the best approach, the best response when we feel powerless and persecuted is to go to war with culture. And that they did. They went to war with culture verbally and militarily. They sought to overthrow this government that was adding pressure to their life through insurrection so that they could reestablish God's kingdom on earth. That was one faction, one sect, one group of people were the revolutionary and the combative. There was also the separatist groups. These were the Essenes, the, the Pharisees you may be more familiar with. They, they were the group that said, we're going to remove ourselves from this culture. We're going to create a subculture of purity and holiness and instead of trying to influence and be a positive light in the culture around them, they jumped ship because they just wanted to wait out God's return in, in an alternative society. Then you had a third faction of people. You had the compromisers. These were the, the blenders and the adopters and the syncretists of the day because they blended the values of culture, the values of their religion, the, the gods that they worshipped, the uh, the idiosyncrasies of that particular faith with the faith that God had given them from birth. And so the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah came into a culture and into a, into a setting, into a season of God's children's lives where he said there's actually a different way. And Jeremiah proposed this way as a prophet of God speaking with the words of God, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, uh, let's see, Jeremiah 29, verse 7, excuse me, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In a moment of exile, in a moment where you're far away from home, in a moment where the pressure and the persecution is overwhelming, Jeremiah says, not a combative response. He provides not a compromising, meet-in-the-middle response, not a separate out of it completely, but Jeremiah says to care well for the people who are against you. This way of caring for people who are against you is a way that we see in the book of Daniel, all throughout the book of Daniel, you may remember the three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, who their very names remind us that those aren't their Jewish names, they're their names given to them in exile. These were three men who were put to work in the king of Babylon's palace. They had a lot of trust given to them. They served and worked faithfully, but they didn't fight when things weren't going their way. They didn't run away under pressure. They didn't compromise so that they could meet the Babylonian king in, in exile. They didn't bow down to an idol. No, they simply cared for the good of those who were against them. By the time we get to the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus was part of a culture 
living under the Roman Empire, not the Babylonian Empire, but make no mistake, it was an equally oppressive empire to grow up in, to do life in, to, to try to navigate culture in. And Preston Sprinkle, author of Exiles, captures Jesus' response to culture in this way. He says, he says this, Jesus was born into a world bursting with various perspectives about the kingdom of Rome and its relationship to the kingdom of God. Jesus could have very well followed one of the popular responses to Rome, but he didn't. He didn't wave the Roman flag alongside the Jewish one or escape to the desert to await the kingdom of God, nor did Jesus join the revolutionaries in violent insurrection. Jesus also didn't go around preaching a non-political kingdom, one that is spiritual, not material, where God's kingdom exists in your heart with no relation to the creation that's destined to burn. Jesus' kingdom didn't fit neatly into any of the available categories of his day. And what we're going to see is that throughout history, throughout enemy rule, throughout persecution, throughout pressure, God's people are called not to combat, not to compromise, but instead to care. As Jesus is speaking to this group of people in the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon that we have been slow walking through the entire summer, a sermon that we've gone verse by verse, word for word, that we've looked back as much as we've looked forward. There are no doubt, as Jesus is preaching this sermon, there are no doubt people in the audience from this group of zealots, from these group of Sicarii who are literally hiding daggers in their cloak, ready to start an insurrection at any moment, hoping with bated breath that Jesus says go. There are no doubt in the audience as Jesus is preaching this Sermon on the Mount, uh, those group of compromisers who have compromised their integrity, their their God-given identity so that they could just mesh into their culture. They're are no doubt in the crowd, groups of Pharisees, those who've separated and said, we just, we got to get out of this culture. This is, this is evil. This is wrong. And yet Jesus shows up to preach this same message to those same people and us today. And this is what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, Jesus has walked through these six statements, these six antitheses, where he hearkens back to an Old Testament law and says, you have heard that it was said. And then Jesus goes on to affirm that that still stands, that that's still good today. You shall not murder. Yes, that's still a good rule of life for us to apply today. But then Jesus goes underneath, he kind of goes upstream to dig into the real heart issues that we, that we face, to, to, to walk through why it is in particular that we struggle with certain things, to figure out what it is that motivates and drives us because Jesus isn't just interested in behavioral modification. Jesus wants to drill down to the heart of the matter of what fuels and motivates us how our thoughts and how our feelings and our desires and our beliefs are twisted in such a way that it causes us to break that law. Yes, the law of murder still stands today, but my followers don't even let anger creep in because when anger creeps in, anger has this way, Jesus reminded us several weeks ago, of dehumanizing people around us. And so we get to the very final of these six statements, these six antitheses, and Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor. Now, in this moment, Jesus is actually quoting from Leviticus chapter 19, verses 15 through 18, which says that we shouldn't hate people. 
shouldn't bear a grudge. We shouldn't slander or seek revenge on a neighbor. We, we shouldn't do any of this negative behavior and actions toward our countrymen, our brother, our family members, our fellow citizens, someone close to you, someone in proximity to your family. Jesus affirms this. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. And then he goes on to say this. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Typically, throughout these six antitheses, Jesus has quoted an Old Testament law. But he goes off script here. Because what's interesting is you can't find anywhere in Scripture that it says to hate your enemies. That was actually a, a, a law, a behavioral practice from this group called the Essenes. The Essenes were in that group of separatists. We're going to get outside of culture. We're going to create this gated community near the Dead Sea. And so that's what they did. They created this uh, prestigious spiritual commune that took the law of God to the extremes. Let me give you an example. They held to a strict Sabbath. And when I say strict, it's not that they didn't just, like, they didn't just stop working. They stopped doing anything that could be considered work to the point that the Essenes actually practiced and put into law that if you're in this community on the Sabbath, you can't even use the restroom. That's too much work. We got to rest. Thank goodness there was no Taco Bell back in that day. Can I get an Amen. That was the length that they went to. They were like the HOAs of the first century. <laughs> they, they, they taught this rule of life, uh, this rule of community that says this, love all that God has chosen and hate all that he has rejected. This is not in scripture. They went on to say, live perfectly before him that they may love all the sons of light and hate all the sons of of darkness. This is where that practice, this law, this rule came in. You've heard it said, love your neighbors. Yes, that's in scripture. We found that in Leviticus 19. But what's not in scripture is this rule of law, hate your enemies. Because basically anyone outside of their gated community and their HOA rules were evil and they thought were outsiders that should be hated. Watch what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbors, hate your enemies. But I say to you, Jesus says, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In one phrase, Jesus flips the world upside down. You've always heard it said. It may have even made logical sense, but I'm here to tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus gives some definition that transforms our relationship with culture. He talks about enemies. Uh, this is anyone who, Jesus is defining, anyone who doesn't share our faith. So they don't have to be like animosity. An, an, they don't have to show animosity. I don't know what I'm trying to say. They don't, have to, they don't have to be adversarial toward you to be an enemy. They don't have to be playing and fighting against you to be an enemy. No, these are the people who just don't believe or behave like we do. Those who are in opposition to what we believe, Jesus would say those are our enemies. But he takes it a step further. Pray for those who persecute you. When Jesus says persecute, he uses this Greek word, uh, Diocantone, which means to be hunted down and pursued with the intent to hunt or kill. We see in this very last passage that, uh, that we looked at a couple of weeks ago that Jesus says, we're not a doormat. We don't have to just lay down and take whatever happens to us in our life because we're created in the image of God with inherent value. And Jesus in that text, right before our text today, covers the individual response. You're not a doormat. You're created in the image of God. Here's how you respond when things go sideways interpersonally. But in our text this morning, Jesus shifts from you to y'all. Jesus moved, like this is the actual Greek. This, uh, this is where people like me from Tennessee actually got it right. He shifts from the individual response to the community response. Here's how y'all ought to respond when culture is pressing in. Here's how y'all ought to respond, Jesus said. I'm convinced it's y'all. When, when, when your community's attacked, when this group of followers of Jesus experiences pressure, when you come across communities and cultures who oppose or reject or confront or insult or even hurt you, what does Jesus say that we do? We, 
we're supposed to love them. Now, this isn't just a passive response. Make no mistake, this is not what the great philosopher Elsa says, let it go. Let it go. Just when it happens, let it go. Just act like it never happened. Or as Dory would say in Finding Nemo to keep up the Disney theme, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. When, when persecution comes, when, when evil is all around, just keep swimming, act like nothing's going on. No, this is not a passive response that Jesus is inviting us to. It is active, but not an active response in a sense that we just get so easily offended. Like we just are so quick to get ticked off at our culture. I can't believe they did that. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna let the governor tell me when I can or can't go to church. I can't believe that the Olympic Committee did that. I, I can't believe that someone who claims to be a Christian would follow this political idea. This political idea is so racist. This political idea is so woke. Let me be clear. None of that's modern day persecution. COVID shutdowns, Olympic opening ceremonies, politicians on both sides of the aisle, while we may not agree with them, while there may be moments that break our hearts because they don't know the Jesus that we love, while they make, may make decisions that we don't agree with, while they may talk about ideas that we can't square with Scripture, let's not confuse that as some modern-day church persecution. Christians can become so soft in our world today. And I'm not saying soft because like we don't speak up uh, against things that happen in our culture. I'm saying we can be so soft because we're so overly sensitive that we are way too easily offended. Listen, Jesus in this text isn't inviting us to be overly sensitive to culturally, cultural complexities so that we then actively speak out against them. So many people sadly still believe that our best witness to the world is our outrage and our offendedness. And yet Jesus says when these cultural complexities come up, what do we do when op opposition rises? We love them and we pray for them. Nowhere in this text, nowhere in Jesus' teaching, nowhere in Jesus' living does he mention speaking out against opposing views with vitriol, hate, and course correction. Course re correction in the ministry and in the life of Jesus comes in the life of his followers, not people outside of the faith. Course correction in Jesus' ministry comes to the religious leaders, the religious elite. We see it time and time again, the modern day zealot in our culture today, who has this inflated and often faulty sense of his or her own persecution as a Christian in the first world, seems to be convinced that the vitriol, the hate, the course correction equals doing justice. That that's what's bringing righteousness and doing the work of the kingdom. That somehow speaking out against things that aren't God-honoring God somehow checks the box of doing God's will. But listen, as followers of Jesus, to love like Jesus, we have to cultivate a spirit that's less easily offended. You know what Jesus did when he was mocked? Which we see Jesus mocked all throughout the centuries, in every culture, in every way possible. You know what Jesus did when he was mocked and spit on? He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When Jesus looked out at the brokenness and the fallen nature of humanity time and time again, he didn't look out and say, I can't believe you're mocking the creator of heaven and earth. I can't believe you're doing it. No, he looked at the brokenness of our world and the people who were hurting with compassion which reinforces exactly what Jesus says in verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and 
the unjust. Jesus redefines love. And he uses this word to describe the love of God, the love of the followers of God. He uses this word agape. It's not affectionate love. It's not a feeling of love, but it's an active action word that means a love that drives us to want to do good for others. It's the same love that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12. As Paul is unpacking what it looks like to live practically as a follower of Christ, Paul says this, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Jesus tells us to love our enemies. How do we do that? It starts by just wanting to work for the good of our enemies. It's more than friendliness. Of course, it includes friendliness. It includes kindness and politeness. But what it looks like is loving people who hate us, loving people who oppose us, loving people who may never love us back for our entire lives. So who are those people that you avoid? Who are those people that avoid you? Who are the people that have hurt you, have hurt your friends, have hurt your family, have hurt your kids? Are you actively wanting good for them? Are you wanting to actively do good things for them? This is what Jesus is getting at because our natural response is retaliation. We don't want to naturally bless those who've hurt us. We don't want to bless those and seek the good of people who have hurt the people that we love dearly. But can I just tell you that this idea of holding back love doesn't come from Jesus. And it can't be found in Scripture. Scripture teaches this, that to be consumed with Jesus and to, to faithfully live out his words. Listen, the the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit does not come into our lives just so that we can act more spiritual and more religious. No, the Spirit of God stirs in us a joy and a peace when we are fixated on Jesus and living our life by faith. On October the 2nd of 2006, a gunman entered the West Nickel Mines School, a one-room Amish schoolhouse just outside of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He took 10 young girls hostage, eventually shooting five of them and injuring several others before taking his own life. And within hours of the shooting, the Amish community visited the shooter's home to let his family know that they forgive the shooter and they forgive his family. They publicly announced their forgiveness and extended compassion to the shooter's family, even though their own children had been victims. They visited the shooter's family. They provided financial support. They extended emotional, uh, emotional comfort. And their response wasn't about excusing the violence. It was about choosing to reject hatred and vengeance in favor of healing and reconciliation. That sort of forgiveness is incomprehensible to the world. Because of it, people have even accused these families of being bad parents, of not dealing properly with their anger, of, of living in denial. But it's this sort of crazy love to the world that is absolutely mind-blowing, a, a, a true love that is found nowhere but through Jesus. And we are commanded to love our enemies. Jesus himself says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's this same kind of love that Jesus said makes us like our heavenly father. He said it this way, so that love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, where he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who just love you, what reward do you have? Don't the tax collectors do this? And if you greet only your brother, what does it mean? You're do what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? God's impartial and radical love pours out over the good and the evil. And Jesus has finally reached this point in the conversation in the Sermon on the Mount 
that you and I reach in a conversation, maybe, maybe where we run out of things to talk about. And so what do we talk about at that point? We talk about the weather. And so Jesus talks about the weather. Look at the weather. Is, don't you know that Jesus, that God controls the weather around us and he gives us this weather report. God sends rain and sun on the good, just like he sends on the evil. Yesterday in Pyongyang, North Korea, home of about 200,000 Christians. You can see the weather report uh, is mostly cloudy. But the sun has shone yesterday in North Korea where Christians are persecuted on a daily basis. If, they, if they're found out for being a believer, it's the end of the road for them. And yet the sun shines in Pyongyang, North Korea, shines on the palace of Kim Jong-un and all the evil that he does. This is the weather report for Mogadishu. Mogadishu is home to less than a 1,000 Christians that remain. Some estimates say that there are even less than three to 400 people who are Christians in Mogadishu, Somalia. And They live in extreme fear of reprisal from Islamic fundamentalists who persecute and kill Christians every day. And right now, or yesterday in Mogadishu, it was cloudy, a nice summer day. Later on in the week in Mogadishu, where Christians are persecuted, it's going to rain and it's going to fall on a, a parched earth where they're desperate for some rain to bring life to their soil. This doesn't make sense to us, that God would provide goodness in places of such evil and darkness. What makes sense to us is loving our neighbors. We can square with that logic. It makes sense in our minds and in our hearts, but loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us, doesn't fit into our minds. It doesn't fit into our cultures. Which therein lies the problem. Jesus doesn't fit neatly into logic. He doesn't align with natural, normal values. His kingdom is not of this world, and nor are his values. Paul Ann Leitner said it this way, it's checkers to chess. The board looks the same, but Jesus isn't playing the same game. If all you've ever known is checkers, when Jesus makes a move that looks like it's within the rules of that game, people go, oh, see, he's on our team. But as followers of Jesus who have been shaped by Jesus, we've got to cultivate this habit of letting his words, his life, this Jesus way shape every way that we live, every way that we speak, every way that we act, every way we react. The Jesus way and his call to love shapes how we lead in love, loving freely and openly without any withholdings. Jesus' invitation to love shapes how we take risks, not elevating safety above the call of God and his plan on our lives. This call to love shapes how we serve. Not seeing an opportunity to serve as a burden, but taking joy and leveraging our life to make a difference. This call to love shapes how we give generously and sacrificially to those who are in need, those who are suffering and those who are sick, knowing that because Jesus calls us to love, he wants his people, his church, to meet the needs around us. This call to love shapes our lives in such a way that we don't live fixated on what's in front of us. Uh, we're not consumed with what we can consume and gather around us. Our eyes are fixed on Jesus and eternity with him. Jesus wraps up these six antitheses, these ideas that go against everything that we've known, everything that we've been taught, everything that culture says we ought to be about. Jesus wraps it all up with this statement. Verse 48, you therefore must be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. When we hear the word perfect, we think of doing everything right, saying everything right, being everything right and having no fault and no problems and no stresses and no issues. And we hear Jesus say this and we're like, Great, how am I ever going to be perfect? But what Jesus is referring to here is he's not meaning to live an error-free life. 
but to be fully mature, fully formed. Literally, Jesus is closing out by saying to us, grow up. Love those who are hardest to love. Love people like I love people, not with the promise of a practical payoff, not that our enemies are gonna become our besties or that we'll win some cultural war or gain influence and power, but we love because we have been so deeply loved. And so the church, God's people, ought to envision or embody the vision of the world that we aspire to create. We ought to be that kind of community we hope to see in the world. A quote most often attributed to Gandhi. He says this, be the change you want to see in the world. So church, let's, let's be with Jesus. Let's spend time soaking in his life, his, his words, his teaching, so that we can become like Jesus for the good of those all around us. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful for teaching that confronts our comfort even when we'd rather stay comfortable. God, I I thank you that you've shown us a way that's different, a way that humbles us to remind us that we've been loved so deeply, so we ought to love others deeply. God, change our hearts where we just want to stand up and spread more hate. God, I pray that we would be known by the way that we love people, by the way that we pray for those who seek our harm. God, may we be people who are different so that when people see us, they'll see Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.